So thank you everyone for joining our KIPS event on digital leadership and how to attract, develop, and retain your top tech talent. In this webinar, we'll explore why creating a digital skills inventory can help organizations and individuals determine the skills they have and plan for the skills required in the future. This webinar also provides a brief introduction to SOFIA, the skills framework for the information age, uh, which is used in nearly 200 countries around the world for digital skills measurement and for establishing a common, uh, common language for skills, competencies, job roles, and job descriptions. Our speaker today is Matthew Burroughs, president of Skills TX, who is an internationally recognized thought leader, SOFIA accredited consultant, assessor, and trainer. Matthew works with companies and governments to improve digital skills management and how to attract, develop, and retain digital ICT, cybersecurity, and other technology-focused professionals. I'd also like to briefly mention that if you are not currently a KIPS member, you can join us at cips.ca slash membership. And if you have any questions about KIPS or this event, uh, you can also send us an email at info at cips.ca. Also like to mention our, our new KIPS skills assessment and career planning tool, which is provided by SkillsTX. Uh, this will allow you to assess your various IT skills uh, see what level your skills are at and plan for the future. So plan what roles you might be interested in, see, see where your skills gaps are, and then plan to upgrade those targeted skills. So really great member benefit. If you haven't checked it out yet, we recommend that you visit it at cips.ca slash skills dash assessment. Um, and from that page, you'll be able to log in with your KIPS member login and assess your skills. Also like to note uh, KIPS's new certification application, which again uses the skills TX skills assessment tool. Uh, previously, KIPS members had to decide which certification to apply for and under what application route. And now it's very easy. We just have a single application, which is for all designations, all application routes. Uh, you simply provide the skills assessment for your experience, along with any IT education that you have and then you will be provided with the KIPS designations that suit your background. For the agenda, uh, Matthew will be providing his presentation and we'll have that followed by a Q&A portion. Uh, we kindly ask that you type your questions in the chat and then I, Jonathan Elias, will uh, provide those questions for Matthew during the Q&A portion. So on that note, I will turn it over to Matthew. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Let me uh, get the technology working and get my um, screen shared. And then I'll just double check everybody can see that okay. Sometimes takes a couple of seconds. Yeah, it's good. coming through yet, Jonathan? Yeah, you can see it. Perfect. You can see it fine. Excellent. Great. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, attending. Um, so I'm going to talk through a few things. You know, let's look at the overall picture, first of all, around talent management skills and competencies. Now, we, we know that uh, things have got more complex in our, our world. Um, it's become increasingly dependent on digital technology. You know, it, it, it's very difficult to find any organization or any industry that doesn't have a, a critical dependency on technology. And there's some clever stuff there. And But we need to also recognize it's not just about the technology. Yeah, of course, we're in the technology business. The technology is important. But we also are in the people business because no matter how clever we are with the technology, we're still dependent on people with various skills and competencies and experience for everything that we do. We still need people to analyze requirements, to architect solutions, design components, manage projects, build, implement, and support the technology solutions that we have. And with that growing dependency on technology in almost all industries, it's probably no surprise that people with the right skills and competencies are in very high demand. 
So that's great news for us as technology professionals. You know, we, there's lots of opportunity there for us. But of course, for organizations, they are often experiencing some skill shortages. So that means that they've got to work hard to keep hold of the good people. Yep, they need to attract the right people, need to keep hold of the good people. And certainly those in digital leadership positions, of course, they have to understand the technology and to set the direction in terms of the technology itself. But we also need to understand our people, our skills and our competencies. And for many of us in IT roles, we're perhaps slightly less comfortable or less experienced with that people and skills area. The technology is in some ways more straightforward and predictable um, when it comes to people and the, their skills and what they do. We have emotions that the technology doesn't have. Our, our responses can be dependent on whether we've had breakfast that morning or whether we've had an argument with our better half the night before. Yeah. So, so often it's, it's harder to manage in many ways. So we need to think about ways of making that easier so that we don't try and dodge the challenge because there's one thing for certain we cannot ignore this the people and the skills piece is a critical dependency we can't ignore it we need to actually address it and the good news is it's much easier than many people fear and there are lots of things out there that can help you and we're going to take you through a few of those things including the Sophia framework as well and show how that helps in this area so just, you know, if you think about this as a, a journey, you know, as individuals, your career is a journey, multiple legs or stages on that journey. Um, yeah, as individuals, we need to take a bit of control of our own skills and competencies, our development planning, plot the routes that are going to work for us. As digital leaders, of course, we need to plot the routes that are going to work for our people as well and keep them engaged and developing and utilized appropriately. So it's a little bit work like working out any sort of route. You know, we can have tools that help us like our phones or our satellite navigation systems. We have maps and naming conventions that name every street and place building on the um, on the planet and we can just tap into that common language to help us make navigation a little bit easier so if i were using my satellite navigation system to plot my route from the airport having just arrived in toronto my air the airport and i want to get to the kips office then I can use that technology. I can turn on my phone. It connects to that satellite navigation system. It plots my current location on a map so I know where I am. The system needs to know where I am to start any planning, but I also then need to tell it where I want to go next. So I put in the details of the KIPS office, put in the address, and then the technology will help me plot different routes depending on traffic conditions, travel preferences, whether I'm going by foot, by car, by train, whatever the method of transport is. It's exactly the same on our journeys with skills and competencies. We need to know where we are now and we need to have a view on where we need to go next and then we can start plotting that journey. And as I say, that's the same for us as individual professionals but it's also the same for managers, for team leaders, for department heads, for chief information officers, and all of the people at every level within technology functions in the organization. So we're focusing on the leadership position at the moment. So let's just explore the situation we find ourselves in as leaders in technology and digital functions. You can see here there's certain challenges you know lots of cios 71 percent of cios finding that skill gaps are going to affect their business you know some of those skill gaps are causing visible business disruption we've got some employees that have got skill gaps they need some help with their development we've got some employees who've got skills that are not being utilized by their employers 
some of those skills might be going out of date. It's quite a, a, an interesting environment. But a lot of organizations don't really know where to start with this um, skills and competencies management area. But one of the things that we can do in order to work out how to hold on to our top technical talent is actually to look at the reasons that people leave organizations. Because if we can address these reasons, we can make it more likely that the best people will stay rather than go to an opportunity elsewhere. So you can see here on the screen a number of reasons why employees leave organizations. You know, they're not engaged, they don't feel part of the journey. They, they're they may have issues with their managers. They might have challenges with their career development and not see a development opportunity. And that's actually the biggest reason that we see when people are asked this question, why are you leaving? There are other factors as well. You can see communication, lack of flexibility and, and so on, or just feeling burned out. But if you look at this graph, which is from the Work Institute, you can see here this lack of career development opportunities is the tallest part of the graph here. It's the biggest reason why people leave. It's not just about salary. It's not just about those other elements. So that's one of the things that we have to address. We also find that hiring is difficult. You know, a lot of um, a lot of times in the past, we would have had senior leaders saying, well, if people leave, we just advertise and recruit new people. When you've got skill shortages, that's not that easy to do. And there's a lot of organizations saying that it's challenging to find strong candidates with the right skills and the right experience. And then, of course, because there's a demand for these skills, as technology professionals, we have lots of opportunity. So we're, we have a certain amount of power. We can pick and choose where we want to go. So we want to go somewhere that's attractive. So what do organizations do about this? There are a few vital ingredients they need. First of all, just like that satellite navigation example, where you need a system, a set of maps, uh, place names, naming conventions, a common language for describing locations, that's really, in skills terms, that's what SOFIA, the Skills Framework for the Information Age, does for us. It is a common language for describing skills and competencies in digital, IT, technology, cybersecurity, systems engineering, lots, lots of IT and technology-related specialisms and disciplines. So as technology professionals, it's our common language. It's the language we use to describe the activity we do and the skills and competencies we need. Of course, some people might be tempted to create their own languages, their own frameworks or skills taxonomies. But that's a little bit like deciding to launch your own global positioning system satellites uh, create a brand new set of maps and naming conventions and rename every building and street on the planet. That would take quite a long time and lots of investment and be difficult to do and difficult to maintain. And therefore, most of us won't bother. We'll just tap into what's there already. Um, we're not in the business of creating new frameworks often. So why not pick Sophia? which is used in nearly 200 countries around the world and is the nearest thing we have to a global, consistent framework, uh, a, a universal language. So that's the first thing, get the language right so that everybody understands each other and what we're talking about. The next step is to know what skills we have. So this is sometimes called the skills inventory. Um, sometimes for an individual, it might be their skill profile. But of course, in an organization, your skill inventory is um, the sum of all of the skill profiles of the people in your organization. And that simply tells you where you are now, where you're starting from on the journey. So that's a good first step. Know what skills you have using that common language of Sophia. So you can say what skills you have. It's all clear. The next thing we need to do is take a view on where do we need to go next. For a lot of individuals, their next steps will be, how do I get better at my current job? 
how do I get to peak level of performance in my current role? That might be the next step on my journey. For others who've reached the full potential of their role, it might be, what's my next step? What's my next role? Promotion or a different type of role, the career path. So wherever you are on the journey, it's the next step. And with those two sets of data, what skills we have, what skills we need, we can do some gap analysis using that data. And then when we look at our gaps, we look at our development needs, we can then address those in development action plans. Now that's from an individual perspective, but of course you, the same thing applies if you're looking at this as a team leader or a manager for your team. You want to know what skills you've got across the team. You want to know where your gaps are and you want to help people prioritize and, and put those into plans. And it's the same at the highest level in the organization, looking across the whole organization as well. So those are the critical ingredients. And if we don't do something about this, we could end up finding out the hard way that we don't have the right skills to deal with our priority challenges. And for each organization, those challenges may be different. Um, but what regularly happens is organizations do find out they've got a skills gap because they suffer from a security breach or a cybersecurity incident, or they end up having a failed project. A lot of organizations struggling with their digital transformation projects and programs at the moment. And often that's about not having the right skills at the right level in the right place. So there's a number of other things that might manifest uh, themselves as, as symptoms that are all directly related to having the right people with the right skills. So for different organizations, your, your focus might be different, but you still need to know what skills you have. We have a digital skills management maturity model. And I'm going to share with you a link at the end of the presentation where you can click on the link and you can answer a few questions. It will take you about 10 minutes to do, and it will help you to plot where your organization is on this maturity scale. It'll give you a report explaining that, giving you a bit of analysis of to help you work out where you want to be and where you need to be as an organization on this scale and some guidance on the next steps you would take to get there. So I'll give you that link at the end. Um, but a lot of organizations are, are at level one. You know, maybe they've, they've worked out they need to do something about people and skills. So they recognize they need to do something, not quite sure what to do yet. And they're looking for a bit of help in starting that journey. OK, that's where most organizations are at the moment. So what does that journey look like? Well, the first thing that companies that are doing well in this space are doing is they're taking a look at the skills they have. Answer that what skills do we have question. And most organizations haven't actually assessed this. They've got a, a vague idea. Perhaps a lot of it is anecdotal. They might have a few ideas of the skills that they think they have within the organization. All I can say from my years of experience, I've been using Sophia for over 20 years, and with the thousands of organizations I've worked with, every single one of them, when you do assess the skills that they have, the skills they really have are different from what they thought they had. And again, the skills that they have and the, uh, are different from the skills that they need. So if you assess and work out these things, it does a number of things. It confirms some of those skills that you thought you had. You do have them. You need them. You can carry on using them. The known usable capability. You get a bonus. It also highlights some skills that you didn't think you had, but you've got them. So you no longer have to worry about them and look for them outside. You can tap into those and use them within your organization, often saving money on having to hire those from vendors or from contractors. If you've got them in the organization, people are probably a little bit frustrated that they're not being able to keep those skills up to date. 
Um, so actually tapping into that resource can also help protect um, your ability to keep those top technical talent in the organization. We do confirm a few skill gaps that we knew about, but more importantly, we, can, we uncover some risks that we didn't know about. And these generally are the ones that tend to cause those catastrophic failures, the things that we didn't expect to happen, the breaches, the things that we make the press for, for through big technology failures, uh, security breaches, data loss, all of those types of things. Often when you delve into those, you find out it's caused by not having the right people with the right skills in the right place. So if we assess what skills we have, we can confirm those and we can take action before they lead to a failure um, and, and often a catastrophic failure. So confirming what they are, we can do something about the risk. What we'll also find out about is if we do this in the right way and we capture a full picture of all of the skills of our people, not just the subset of skills they use in their current role, but also the skills they may have from their previous role or from a project they worked on last month, something that's not core to their current job, but nevertheless, it is a current and up-to-date skill. We need to know about those because the technology world has become even more dynamic and changing more rapidly than it ever used to. And some of those skills that we might not need today might be the skills we need next week for an agile sprint, a task in a sprint, or next month for a project that's starting, or in three months time for a new product or service that we're launching. So it's essential to have that complete bigger picture of all of the skills we have. So that's the first step. Confirm the skills you have. Take a view on the skills that you need. Of course, doing that using the common language of Sophia, that, that uh, common language for describing those skills and competencies. And then... For your people, taking a genuine interest in their current skills, not just the ones in their current job, but the complete picture, so that you have a skill profile for each person, and that because you've got it for each person, you have a skill inventory for your organization. Be clear and transparent about the skills that are needed for each of the roles, each of the projects, each of the activities that you have in the organization, and make that visible to people. If people can see that there is an opportunity, there's a potential career path for them in the organization, they're more likely to stay. So this shows them that development opportunity that they didn't think was there and often is the reason why people leave. So make that visible. And then empower the individuals and their managers to keep their skill profile up to date as their skills change over time. So when they complete training, they complete development, they complete projects and other tasks, they will be building new skills and, and, and developing their capability. So you want them to update their skill profiles so that uh, it's always a current picture. Then you want them to work together to prioritize and identify the development actions and put them into a plan. So embed that data-driven decision-making into your organization. So they're always thinking about the people and skills related elements and that they're aware of the risks and they can do something about them. So that's really the typical sort of path that we have to actually getting better at doing this. You know, we have when we when we tend to adopt something like Sophia, we've obviously got to think about managing the change. Communication is really key. You've got to explain to people what you're doing. Why are we assessing the skills of the organization? Why are we building a skills inventory? What data are we going to collect? What are we going to do with that data? And how is it going to help each individual? How is it going to help the organization as a whole? So that whole management of change, the engagement and communication element to get everybody on the same page, get everybody on board with the journey. So engage them. Then work out what skills people have got, which is often a process of assessment 
um, so people can self-assess. That's one one of the options, and and that's what each of you can do as KIPS members in the Skills TX tool, going through the KIPS website. So you can assess what your current skills are using Sophia. That's a great starting point. When you do this in an organisation, of course, you've got the ability then to talk to your manager to review have your skills looked at, have that conversation to make sure uh, the data is really high quality and you know all the skills, the ones you're using, the ones you're not using, making sure everybody's aware of your full potential. Then comparing it with the roles and defining what skills are needed and then using that data to make the decisions and to prioritize. And that's how we get value for the individuals, for the managers, for the whole organization. So hopefully that, that journey makes some sense. And when organizations are using Sophia, you know, typically you know, it can be as short as four to six weeks to actually adopt Sophia across your organization. You don't need to be looking at multi-year projects for doing this stuff. Yeah, it can be a lot more straightforward than you think. So that's a fairly typical sort of six week Sophia project uh, plan overview you can see there with those stages. So hopefully that's that's helpful. I'll give you a bit of an overview of how organizations typically uh, adopt Sophia. I'm gonna cover a, a couple of other elements here, just a, a few more details if that's okay. Jonathan, do jump in if you've got questions that, that have come up. I'm uh, busy talking away here. So do feel free to interrupt me if, that, uh, if, if that's useful. But if not, I plow on. Uh, but I'll leave you to int interrupt me if you need to. Sure. Yeah, I got a couple of questions, but we'll save it for after. Okay, Thanks. no problem. That's fine. So just getting into a little bit more detail, that, that there is a, a difference between our types of capability that we have. It's not as straightforward as you've either got a skill or you haven't. We go on a journey. And often that journey is starting with accumulating the knowledge that we need. So a lot of us have been on training courses and a lot of training courses are really focused on giving the, us the theoretical knowledge, the background the understanding of a subject. So of course you can get recognized for that. You can get a training certificate, you can get a digital credential badge. It depends what your training provider um, provides for you. But knowledge is only one stage. You know, I might in theory know how to drive a car, but unless I've had the opportunity to actually put that theory into practice and drive the car, I'm not really going to become proficient at driving. I'm not going to start to develop that capability into a skill. It's just theory at the moment. It's knowledge. Still valuable. We all need the background knowledge, but we also need the opportunity to apply that knowledge often in a working environment, so we can practice it, maybe make a few mistakes, maybe have some guidance from mentors, coaches, managers, uh, more senior people that, that, are, that are experienced. But once we do the activity a number of times, we're starting to develop a skill. We're becoming proficient in the skill. Doesn't mean that we're the world's best expert in it, but we're capable. And under this new um, Sophia assessment mechanism that the Sophia Foundation has launched, we've defined these different things. So we know what knowledge is. We can test that. We can, we can certify people for knowledge. We know what that next stage is, skill proficiency. We have a set of criteria in line with international standards for how to assess that. The next step is once you become proficient in a skill, keep doing it and eventually you become fully professionally competent. So that's when your capability is fully developed. You have learned everything, you've done it all in that skill at that level. Your development focus is now on maybe the same skill at a higher level or maybe a different skill. So again, that, that's, that's really reaching full professional competency. Um, so again, you can be assessed and um, uh, certified or badged for that. We also have mechanisms for recognizing roles and how, how good people are in, in 
collections of skills that are that are recognized as roles and one example of that might be Sophia accredited consultants like myself there's a criteria that I need to demonstrate my experience at before I can get that accreditation so it's just recognizing there's a difference between these things you know as a professional knowledge is important of course but we also need the opportunity to apply that knowledge in order to develop the skill, practice it to become proficient so that every time we do that activity, we're achieving good quality results. And then turning that into a, a full specialism, a professional competency. And we do have the ability to be professionally recognized for those levels against that common language of Sophia. So just to introduce that that idea and uh, just another way of looking at this, you know, knowledge, applying the knowledge, skill proficiency, more professional experience, becoming professionally competent. And a lot of that is embedded into the KIPS program, as, as Jonathan mentioned at the beginning of this. Actually, Sophia is used within the assessment of the different levels that you have within that scheme. So this recognizes your experience using Sophia, uh, either for your what Sophia calls generic responsibility levels at a particular level or your competency in a skill. So that's just a broad alignment there. So don't forget, you know, as Jonathan said, you've got that opportunity as individuals to do your self-assessment using the tool, which we provided that. So that's free. You can go in and use that and start your journey. And of course, if you then within your employer organization, if you want to apply this more widely, your employer can actually have their own uh, instance of that tool. They can buy licenses and have their own workspace within Skills TX and start to define the skills that are important to their organization. So the, the roles and the jobs in your organization and start to see that skill inventory for the whole organization. So I promised you the link to the um, digital skills management maturity assessment. Um, I've got that in here. There's a QR code for those of you that use QR codes. There's also a, a, a URL embedded here. I think Jonathan will probably try and make the slides available in PDF format for people as well. I think we normally do on these things. Um, I'll, I'll bring that slide up again at the end. What I was going to do is, as Jonathan said at the beginning, just give you a little bit more detail on the Sophia framework itself, if that's OK. So the Sophia framework, we're, we're currently on version eight of the framework, and that was released in September last year. We have regular updates to Sophia. I say regular. It's usually every three to four years we publish a major version. So Sophia has been around for 20 years. We're on version eight now. And that's simply because the skills and competencies change. You know, if we'd been talking about technology 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't have mentioned data science or artificial intelligence or machine learning quite as much as we do at the moment when we're talking about skills and competencies. So new things come along. We sometimes change the way we talk about skills. The activities do change things change so we reflect those changes in new versions of the uh, Sophia framework so it covers quite a wide range um, you can each of you if you want to have a look at more detail the Sophia foundation website url is there on the slides as well but let me take you through a little bit of the detail of sort of different uses of Sophia before i dive into the structure so as individual technology professionals, we can, of course, use Sophia to assess our current skills and competencies, to compare them with roles, to start looking at our career planning and our professional development. And for those of us that might be looking for work, we can use that skill profile as our digital CV or resume. You know, it's a statement of our current capabilities. There's lots of ways in which you can use that data. Then, of course, as line managers, to manage the people within their organization, to work out who to deploy to different tasks that need to 
happen, whether that's projects, sprints, individual tasks, or different roles within the organization. We can use Sophia to forecast our demand as well as to state our capability, often used in job descriptions. We can use it for strategic planning. We can use it in transformations, in mergers and acquisitions. There's always a skills related um, viewpoint for all of those things. Human resources professionals use it as well, obviously to create role profiles and job descriptions, to do workforce planning, uh, succession planning, career pathways and those sorts of things. Learning and development professionals use it as well to help make sure that people have the most appropriate learning and development opportunities to the skills that they need to focus on. Mentioned, you can also use it in recruitment. So um, quite a lot of organizations are asking people to do a Sophia self-assessment as part of the recruitment process. So you apply for a role and you then, if you haven't already, assess your skills against Sophia. And then they can use that in their matching and in their selection and filtering processes. We also use Sophia in a number of different ways as consultants in designing organizations, in helping organizations to get better at uh, uh, the processes and procedures. In procurement, it's used as well uh, for deciding which vendors, which third party suppliers to engage when having managed services and outsourcing. So there's some quite interesting ways in which Sophia is used. And of course, in the development and professional um, bodies as well. And there are quite a lot of training providers who've mapped their training catalogs to Sophia. And that can help us to identify the training that is relevant to the specific skill at the level that we want to focus on. So hopefully that reduces the chances of us going on training that's pitched at the wrong level. You know, if we know we, we've got project management at level four already, and we're focusing on developing at level five, then we'll find that mapping will direct us perhaps to a practitioner course rather than a foundation course. So it helps to um, prioritize and, and, and identify the most appropriate training. So just a, a real high level view of different uses of Sophia. There are more, of course. But I want to just show you the structure of Sophia. So within Sophia version eight, we have 121 professional skills that are described in the framework. We have a seven level structure. So each skill will be described at one or more of the seven levels in the structure. Level one being an entry level type skill, uh, perhaps something you do straight out of education probably very structured, following scripts, seeking guidance and, uh, and advice if, if anything doesn't go to plan. Um, so uh, that's sort of level one tasks. And as we go up through level one, two, three, and four, an increasing level of ownership and responsibility for the outcome of the tasks. And then when you switch to level five, it's taking a wider view on how things are done. So a lot of consultants and managers might be at level four, level five. Level six, more focus on policy and strategy, and level seven, the, the most senior uh, leaders and subject matters experts in an organization. So you can see how the seven levels work. So each skill being described at one or more of the levels, we only describe a skill at the levels at which a skill is actually practiced in the working world. Um, not, none of the skills are, are practiced at all seven levels. Um, so it does depend on the skill. And I'll show you a bit of detail on that in a moment. We structure the skills into categories. So we have six categories, as you can see listed here. So strategy and architecture, change and transformation, and so on. They're color coded. Um, and that's really just to help navigation around the framework. So you can find your way and you can find, find the relevant skills you're looking for, rather than looking at a flat list of 121. It's just a, a, a way of helping you to navigate around the framework. So that's the structure. Then if we dive into each of those categories, you can see the sorts of skills that are covered within them. So under strategy and architecture category, we have some subcategories, strategy and planning, security and privacy, governance, risk and compliance and advice and guidance. 
And you can see a number of skills there, strategic planning, solution architecture, demand management. There's quite a wide range of different skills, even financial management in a technology related setting. And what you probably notice is that within the strategy and architecture category, there are no level one skills and there are very few level two and level three skills. And hopefully that makes sense. You know, when you're doing strategic planning, it's not something you do as the first task out of education with no experience. It's not something you can really do just by following the numbered steps on a procedure. It's something that generally you need some experience in order to do. And that's why when, when we look at what happens in the working world or around the world in various countries, that's what we only really find strategic planning activity at levels five, six and seven. So in Sophia, we just describe it at those three levels because it doesn't exist at the lower levels. And that's how it works in terms of the structure. So you'll find in strategy and architecture, you probably expect the skills to be more to the right hand side of that model, more to the higher levels within that seven level structure. You've got quite a lot of uh, different skills here, some security and information, vulnerability research, threat intelligence, governance, audit, quality management, uh, as well as things like consultancy and specialist advice. So that's strategy and architecture. The next category is change and transformation. This is where you'll find the project program portfolio management skills. You'll find a lot of skills that are, are used by business analysts like business situation analysis, feasibility assessment, requirements, definition and management, as well as things like organizational capability development, organizational change management, benefits management. In the next category, the yellow category, development and implementation, this is where you find a lot of your design and build type skills. So things like uh, product management, system development management, design around system design, software design, network design, all sorts of different elements, programming and software development. So doing the coding, um, all the way through to a, a bunch of data and analytics type skills here. So a lot of data scientists, for example, uh, will have a number of these skills in this category. And we've got user experience, a lot of UX focus for many developers at the moment. So a, a bunch of skills around there, content management, and then computational science as well. In the brown category, delivery and operation, these are more of our support type processes. A lot of these align with service management uh, terminology that we use. So you'll find things like technology service management, application support, network support, config, release. Um, you'll find instant management, problem management, change control, um, as well as some more operational security level um, skills, so security operations, vulnerability assessment digital forensics and penetration testing. Then we come on to the next category, so people and skills. So a bunch of people management skills, performance management, uh, professional development, workforce planning, some of those skills you might find in HR people. Often you'll find a number of those skills in managers and team leaders. Then we have skills management, so learning and development, learning deliveries, so trainers will have those skills competency assessment, uh, the sorts of skills Sophia assessors like myself have, um, and so on. So that's people and skills. And then the last of the six categories is relationships and engagement. And this is where you'll find sourcing, supplier management, contract management, stakeholder relationship management, as well as some sales and marketing skills as well. And, and this brings up an important point, you know, the, the skills within Sophia I hope you can see from that list alone that, that actually they're quite wide ranging. They're often a wider scope than many people would think of as pure IT skills. And, and that really just reflects our working world as well. A, a lot of digital and IT and technology related skills are now in people that are not part of an IT department. They're spread throughout the organization because the organization's so much more dependent on technology these days. So we're not trying to describe these professions in their entirety. We're talking about technology related skill sets, 
Sophia is still a framework that focuses on technology. It's not trying to cover every uh, career out there. You will not find skills in there for chefs on how good they are with knives or cooking. Uh, it is technology related skills. So that's a quick overview of the, of the skill structure. There's another part of Sophia that covers what we call um, generic responsibility attributes. So there are five of these, autonomy, influence, complexity, business skills, and knowledge. And each of those five attributes are described at each of the seven levels that we have in, in the framework. So on the screen here, you can see the, the level one descriptions, uh, but there's a description for each of the other levels as well. So this covers quite a lot of the behavioral factors. Some people refer to these as soft skills. Some people hate the term soft skills, but uh, um, you know that they're, they're more general and generic. So they're covering things like communication skills, team working, how to influence. You, know, how, um, you can see examples down there. So that's another element to Sophia. And that's really important because sometimes our development needs are not just in the professional specialisms, those professional skills. Maybe we've got everything we need in there, but actually maybe the gap for us is our ability to influence or our ability to communicate and to uh, deliver um, the information across the stakeholders. So it's an important part of our development plan. And then we're coming up to, to the last couple of slides here. So just to show you, I showed you those high level 121 skills, just taking one of those skills and showing you the structure that Sophia has below them. So I've used the example digital forensics, which is one of the 121 skills. Um, each skill has a similar structure. So it's got a unique name. It's got a four letter skill code, which is just a shorthand code to help lazy people like myself who don't like to write too much. I can just write four letters instead of having to write digital forensics. We always have an overall description. So a sentence of text that gives you a high level uh, explanation of what that skill is about. Some guidance notes to give you a little bit more context below that, including typical activities uh, and the scope of that. And then we have a description for each of the levels at which that skill is practiced. In this case, digital forensics, we describe that at level three, four, five, and six. And you can see just broadly, level six is supporting digital forensics investigations. Level four is designing and executing slightly more complex investigations. Level five, conducting them, so leading them, gathering the requirements, uh, collating conclusions and making recommendations. And level six, you're really planning the policy and the strategy for how all digital forensics investigations happen across your organization. So you can see some people might practice this skill at just one level, other people might practice it at multiple levels, and that's how Sophia works. So just uh, last, last slide before closing, remember the Sophia Foundation website is also a good source of information there. We have a lot of uh, content on our skillstx.com website as well. So uh, if you've got more questions, you want a bit more information on the framework, both of those are great sources for that. And then I'm just going to put up my last slide because I promised you I'd put that to QR code and that link again if you want to assess where your organization is on this uh, journey and to get some help and guidance on moving forward. That, as I say, takes about 10 minutes to do, is entirely free of charge, and that'll give you a lot of information that'll help you build the business case and to have that conversation internally about adopting Sophia for your organization. And with that, I'll stop rambling on and I will, uh, uh, Jonathan, please, I'll hand over to you for questions and anything I've missed. Oh, well, thank you, Matthew, for that amazing overview of Sophia and all the amazing use cases. Uh, we will now jump into the Q&A portion. Uh, the first question that we have is, is there a comparison credentialing system or an, another approach to Sophia? 
So um, I'm going to check I understand the question correctly. So a credentialing system, yes, we have a mechanism for recognizing and issuing credentials for people for their knowledge, the skill proficiency or their competency. So there is a, a, a scheme that, that allows people to be assessed and to be awarded against a, a consistent international criteria. Uh, there's some more detail on that on the SOFIA website. But part of that bigger picture is, of course, also the uh, credentialing that the organisations like KIPS do for your different levels that you have uh, of professional recognition. Um, so if, I'm not sure whether within that question, it's whether there are other frameworks instead of Sophia. So I'll cover yeah. that as, as well, if I may. Yeah, um, there's a clarification for the question there. So aside right. from Sophia, is there another credentialing system out there? Right. OK, um, so there are some other frameworks that do similar things to Sophia, but nothing that's got the widespread use of Sophia. So I mentioned Sophia is used in about 200 countries around the world. There is a European competency framework, which is used in uh, by quite a small number of organisations in a couple of European countries. There are some local country specific frameworks for example, in Japan, there's one called ICD, the Competency Dictionary, um, uh, but that's actually mapped to Sophia as well. So a lot of these local country frameworks, they recognize that their country framework, the language only makes sense in their country. It, as I say, it's a bit like creating your own set of maps and your own uh, positioning system. You know, if you have something that's only relevant within your company or within your country, other people won't understand. And the limitations of some of those other frameworks just being recognized in one country, the, the, the world of technology is a bit more international than that. Most of those organizations have to deal with other countries. Some of their resources might come from other countries. So the simple answer is there isn't anything anywhere near as comprehensive or widespread used as Sophia. There's just a few uh, local country frameworks. Many of those have been mapped to Sophia. Great. Uh, next question is, how often should individuals and organizations update their skills inventory? Yeah, very good question. If you'd asked me what was common practice on this five to 10 years ago, a lot of organizations would have done this periodically. So they would have got people to assess once and then maybe in three years time, they would assess them again. Uh, and they would do it either every three years or some organizations were doing it every year. Um, I would say over the last five years, particularly, that's become slightly outdated. The pace of change is so much more rapid now that actually the emerging good practice is to simply update the skill profile whenever your skills change. So don't have it as a periodic thing. Just, you know, if you complete another development action, update your action plan and update your skill profile. If you've just finished a project assignment and you, you think you've developed new skills or existing skills at a higher level, update your skill profile then. So it's become dynamic and, and that, that I'm seeing massive benefits uh, for the individuals and, and for the organizations as well. And that, that approach has become much more widespread. I think to back that up, there are some key natural points where you would at least ask the question, is my skill profile up to date? Did I miss some updates? And, and usually in organizations, they're just before the performance review or the development planning session that you're having with your manager, or when you're going for a job board or a promotion or, or something like that. So some of those act as triggers just to remind us in case we've forgotten, but Certainly the advice is keep your skill profile up to date whenever your skills change, update it. And it's the same with organizations with their role profiles and job descriptions. And we've seen lots of bad examples. A lot of job descriptions out there haven't been reviewed for five years or more, and they simply do not reflect the skills that are needed in that role today, let alone in six months time. So again, organizations are starting to understand that and know that they need to have mechanisms to at least review them manually to check they're still up to date. Great. Uh, next question, uh, do you use Sophia in the interview or uh, onboarding process? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so a lot of organizations I'm working with 
as soon as you apply for a job, they will get you to do a Sophia self-assessment. They will compare your self-assessment with the job description, the Sophia-based job description they've written, because it allows that common currency. They can view everybody in similar way. And it's much fairer because you're, you're judging people on their experience, on their skills and competencies. So that's where they f- often first use it. And then during the recruitment process, um, if you've got through that first filtering gate and you're still a good high match against the role after that first stage, um, then they've shortlisted a smaller number. They might then have uh, an interview, a technical interview or a telephone discussion or something like that to talk about your experience. And they'll use Sophia for that. What they're really doing is just validating or endorsing the skills you have and just checking you can give them good examples that prove it's not just theoretical knowledge, it's actually practical experience. They'll then use that endorsed profile again to compare with the job description. And if you're still a good enough match, maybe go through to interview, which is often the next stage. And then often at interview, they will use Sophia to help structure their questions. Because if you know that the job requires you know, project management at level five, you can actually use the Sophia description to help you form a question to ask a candidate, um, you know, uh, how did you do risk management in your project? How do you deal with stakeholders? How many projects have you run? So they, they, can, they can use Sophia language in those interviews as well. Awesome. And uh, we'll try to fit in maybe one quick more question uh, regarding uh, creating an action plan for organizations. So um, as KIPS members have used the skills assessment tool, they'll know you can assess your skills and then create an action plan to upgrade targeted skills. Uh, for organizations, would they do something similar where they get their employees to do skills and do an assessment? Or would you recommend they, they hire like a Sophia assessor or consultant to do that for them? So I would recommend that they do the assessment that they get individuals to do the assessment you don't necessarily need a consultant to help you um yeah and we certainly when we design tools like the skills tx digital skills management tool we designed it so people can just pick that up and use it and we build in training we build in uh, wizards and guides and uh, even uh, sort of communications videos in there to help people through that process So certainly organizations can do this without requiring any consultancy. Some organizations do elect to do a bit of extra training, maybe get a Sophia trainer to help them um, or to get a Sophia consultant in really just often to do some heavy lifting if they're time poor. It's really about their bandwidth. You know, if if you've got to update um, or map 50 existing job descriptions to Sophia if you've got the bandwidth to do it you can use the training and you can do it yourself but often companies are quite time poor so they sometimes prefer to get in an experienced Sophia consultant to do a specific task for them or just to check their planned approach to check there are no gotchas in there based on experience so it's really up to the individual organization how much they want to do themselves how much they want some external support. But certainly it's available, whatever they need, whether it's just tools, training and supporting services, or indeed full sort of professional services engagements to help them through that project. Wonderful. Um, So with our last minute here, um, I'd briefly like to mention that um, if you haven't already, I uh, recommend checking out our KIPP skills assessment and career planning tutorial with Matthew, uh, which this just gives you an in-depth overview of the skill assessment membership benefit. And um, also, again, just walks into details of all those uh, Sophia elements, how can, you can use this nice little tool to basically do a survey to assess your skills and then get a nice little output summary sheet of your various general skills, as well as uh, the specific skills that you have. And again, uh, the link is in the chat and you can also find it on the KIPS website. Uh, Also briefly like to mention again, if you're not yet a KIPS member, um, obviously you can take advantage of that skills assessment benefit. Uh, So we highly recommend that you join us at uh, kips.ca slash membership. And also again, big thank you for Matthew for taking his time uh, to provide this overview of uh, the amazing Sophia framework 
And again, all the integration in terms of uh, KIPP Center certification and, and member benefits. So thank you, Matthew. And thank you everyone for joining us today and looking forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Matthew, that was great.